the potential issues, and the, we'll track back to this get with the guidelines, I think, is you know, in the old days, we were all concerned with reducing length of stay, inappropriate stays in the hospital too long, et cetera, et cetera. So then we were uh, putting people out sooner. Mm -hmm. And then the question is, if we're doing that because we were incentivized as a health profession to do that, are we sort of setting up the stage for readmission because maybe they weren't in long enough to get what they needed or adequately <coughs> assessed? Um, so, to, but hopefully, you know, this the patient management tool and, and, and some of the issues here should help that, that, that at least we're treating according to you know standard therapies. But do you see that as an issue that you know we length of stay lower, so we're pushing these patients out now they're coming back as a as a readmit? How, how do we fine-tune that maybe a little bit better? I think it's a really good point you bring up. I know that um, Dr. Fonro also recently issued a paper that talked about just readmissions as a quality indicator and looking at mortality rates also and, and should readmission rates really be the, the key quality indicator. Um, but you know, to your point, I think it's important for each hospital to work with their their physicians and their clinicians to ensure that patients are there for the appropriate amount of time um, and that while there you know they're receiving everything that they should because I, I, I absolutely agree it is I remember you know calculating a metric you know even 10 years ago we wanted to know what their average length of stay was and now we've really shifted to this remission reduction so it, it, it is a challenge, and I, I don't have the perfect answer, unfortunately, but I think it's a really important topic to keep on our radar. Go ahead. Can I just add to that? So that brings me back to get with the guidelines, using evidence-based um, practice to apply to that patient's care while they are there. It's really key to get these interventions started right away so that those interventions are in place and hopefully, hopefully hardwired through their discharge and back into home. So that's the hope. That is some, the, the, the balance between um, early discharge or, uh, you know, appropriate early discharge, right? Appropriate discharge versus um, readmissions is something that is always being watched. And that is something that we do look at with Get With The Guidelines in terms of how can we plan our interventions so that we're looking at both those treating the acute patient and also treating the chronic condition. I have another question on that. Just um, you showed some improvement there from, from some of the LA hospitals. The the question I might ask is: Have we, in that improvement, do we ever see that a patient might come back after admission, but now they're not admitted because I'm as a hospital. I'm trying to game the system. I'm not really I trying know, to game the system. I know. Just throwing out. Like they'll go into observation. They'll go into yeah. observation, which is an outpatient <laughs> setting, so that doesn't get counted as a readmission. I, are you, I mean, it's probably early to see that, but are we tracking for that or looking at it? or? That information is not publicly available, and it's not something that you know the AHA tracks, but kind of stepping aside from the AHA, well, I think it's an important question. I think it's always important when looking at quality metrics with the unintended consequences of measuring and also penalizing hospitals would be. So I, I absolutely agree it's important to, to look at those trends. Uh, Carol, I would kind of add on to uh, your question and the answers. Sometimes it's like a balloon. Yeah, you know, we push on one side and then the other side. Yeah, um, and uh, we used to note that observation rates will go up as your um, you know, length of stay went down as people come back and then they get admitted <laughs> under another category. So it isn't. And that also has effects on payment as to who's covering it, co-pays, right. uh, patients have to pay, et cetera. Yeah, especially for Medicare. Exactly. So all of this has to be taken in whole, I think. And I think the goal overall is while you have, get with the guidelines or you have a goal that you would like to reach, you also, and uh, what was brought up, have to keep in mind individuals have to, are still individuals. They have to be uh, uh, treated as such, and uh, you hope for overall gains when you do when you treat the whole overall population. But some will exceed a length of stay, and some will not. But overall, with your program, 
you'll be able to lead to a reduction, uh, which will translate, and, and the big message here I hear is, will translate into hospitals receiving more funds through not losing funds. Right. So how is uh, sus sustainability addressed, both in setting up the program and then for patients that are discharging, you're talking about medications, getting medications and so forth, uh, so particularly in that instance, how is uh, sustainability addressed? Sure. I can start. You can okay. you can chime in. So as Liz was mentioning earlier, it's really about hardwiring some of these processes in place. So for example, getting a follow-up appointment prior to discharge and getting that on the books is really important to reducing readmissions. But if the average length of stay is shortening or we're not really sure when that's happening, we need to start up we need to have a better way to think about that. So one of the recommendations that, that we make and I've seen hospitals start doing is as soon as that person's admitted, they're starting to call a physician and just estimate how far out that it'll be. And so that's an example of a hardwire process that we can work with hospitals to implement so that no matter what, the program is sustainable long term, even with staff turnover. As long as there are processes in place, it should be sustainable. And it also really depends on that the process itself in terms of the um, logistics are really left up to the facility at their home level because the facility knows their community, they know their resources the best. We can share best practices, we can share what, this is what's worked and in a facility that might be the same size or reach the same kind of population, but um, the logistics usually are, the heavy nitty, nitty gritty is usually left up to the facility itself. And then in terms of the discharge, we will work with hospitals, and actually I have a, I can just skip through. Um, no, we don't want to skip through. I'll go back, I just want to show something really quick. Um, so we have a lot of resources available, and I'll go through these, but we have a patient interview form that can be used after discharge, and based on the results of this interview form, we can work with the hospitals to see what the individual barriers to care are post-discharge. So for example, if they're having a really hard time getting a prior off for a drug that was prescribed at discharge, perhaps a hospital will give them coupons for 30 free days of that, of that prescription while the discharging physician will work to get that prior off with, with the PCP and, and that handoff. So that's something that I've seen work really well, but it really just depends on, on, on your patient population and what they're encountering after discharge. So I just want to say that Shawnee has some fantastic slides that we haven't seen oh, yeah. yet. Okay. And I'd love to have her <laughs> be able I'll to just, go through them. No, thanks. And so um, Liz and I will be here after. If you have any additional questions about Get With The Guidelines or want more information, we can certainly follow up with you on that. I pulled a few metrics out of Get With The Guidelines that, to me, were the most uh, striking. I looked at the California hospitals compared to hospitals nationally. Now this represents hospitals participating in Get With The Guidelines only, so we, I, you could expect this rate to probably be higher than what it, that it is nationally, but the first measure is activity level instruction, so whether or not heart failure patients were discharged home with a copy of written instructions or educational materials. And in California, that percentage is 29%, and, a, and it, nationally it's higher at 68%. So, go ahead. Can you just elaborate a little bit? It says activity level instruction. Are you talking about rehab, or what mm -hmm. is that? Yes, so instructions or educational material about what, what can happen after at discharge. So activity level, mm -hmm. what comprises activity level? So what types of activities should the patients be doing and how can they be doing that? Um, does that help answer your question? Uh, another measure is the flu vaccination. Um, and at the state level, it's 54%. Nationally, it's 76%. In speaking with hospitals, this has actually been challenging here, at least in LA, to get physician buy-in on, on doing this. I don't know if anyone has any thoughts about that, but 
Um, but certainly, I think an area worth pointing out and maybe warning future conversations. Keith, that was quite a comment. What did you mean? Well, I know. <laughs> I don't want to say. Anything, yeah. um, you know, a, a lot of times we have to recognize what we're fighting is um, uh, in trying to improve patient health. We're taking money out of the hands of the physicians. At least they feel that way. Yeah. And so that comment was simply that uh, some physicians may feel that I don't want you to give them that injection in the hospital. I want to give it in the, high, in, in the office. Right. I can bill for it or whatever. I, you know, it's, so a, it's a no copay service I, everywhere. I don't understand. So th this, is where not, this, is, this is where physician yeah, provider can. education needs to, yeah. needs to improve. That's why I said, that's why I said oh, it, you have to look at the whole pie. There, there are many pieces that when you squeeze on one, it pops out someplace else. <laughs> <laughs> Did you want to comment, uh, Scott? That's California versus the nation, right? Yes. What are the anti-establishment uh, characteristics of California versus the nation? Well, they're definitely anti-vaccination. Right, the anti-vaccination crowd, right? That's true. Yeah. But it's kind of consistent across these red, white, and blue slides, isn't it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you can you can probably take flu and substitute any other vaccination you want there. Yeah. Right? But, but let's go back one slide. More for childhood vaccination. So even for for prescribing uh, rehab, why would in California we be doing a worse job by half than the nation? You're a, a physiology expert. Do you have a, a hypothesis on that one? I think someone. As Tony mentioned it earlier, time and attention and what you're doing and thinking about revenue generation. I don't get paid extra to do this kind of stuff. And how do I fit it in my workflow? Somebody mentioned that earlier. Or was that you? Yeah, and I think, you know, yeah. like, do all hospitals have a, a nice booklet ready to go for all their heart failure patients would address all of this and, and a, a part for their modifiable risk factors? I mean, that's kind of what we're looking to get to the hospitals and, and get to that point. Or is it available in the patient's language that they speak? True. Mm -hmm. yeah, culturally appropriate, right? There's mm -hmm. a whole bunch of stuff that goes into that. This is a similar metric on follow-up instruction. It's very similar to the first one I showed. I did want to highlight something that California is doing well is the follow-up visit within seven days or less. So uh, statewide, we're at 73% and nationally, 66%. Is that strict Medicare data? No, it is all payer data for the hospitals participating with our program. Would you mind going back things, one slide? One of the things Medicare did right a couple years ago, as most folks are aware, is they increased reimbursement rate if you do a post-hospital and I think that they put money on it and I think that then that started hardwiring some of these processes to make sure that that's happening yeah the primary care dog was interested in that right exactly so this one though should be very interesting to everyone in this room I mean that is really paltry yeah I mean I'm wondering if it's because I've done I'm a little suspicious of the follow-up instruction metric as being something meaningful because we've instituted some of these at times and they don't mean anyone talked to the patient about them. They don't mean the patient read it. They don't mean the patient enacted any of it. This to me could represent like an electronic health record phenomenon, like maybe all the nation as a whole compared to your group has different kinds of electronic health records where it's easier to get the instructions. Like, I don't know. I can't think of any reason why California physicians would be so different about follow-up instructions. No, and, and it could be documentation too, right? Like if it's not being documented appropriately in the medical record, then then it's not, then the abstractors aren't picking it up. So it, it could just be a documentation issue. I don't want to alarm anyone saying that the, the California physicians aren't doing this. You know, maybe they are, but maybe we need to get better about measuring it. So we're really comparing apples to apples. And who, who usually does that? Is it the physicians, the hospitalists, or is it the nursing staff who are the discharge? It, I think it's the nursing staff of mine. It's usually set up, it's usually set up as um, part of the nursing staff's responsibility. Right. So, I mean, it, I, it's hard for me to imagine somebody goes home from the hospital without discharge instructions. Yeah, right, because that's part of the discharge. But 
Are, are you saying they don't have specific heart failure discharge instructions? Correct. Or yes. they didn't have any discharge instructions? Heart failure specific. Okay, okay so I'm just trying to take this all in. Sorry, I know this is a big disconnect. But I also know there's a bill sitting on the governor's desk right now, 1254, that brings the pharmacist in into the hospital to really start putting the medicines all together because I think one of the <coughs> disconnects is when people <coughs> leave the hospital, their medicines might have changed. They go home, they have all these medicines still at home. They don't know what they should throw away, what they should keep, but they don't understand that. And so they go home and they start taking extra things. Oh, I took this, oh no. They ha that's a place that really could, um, that gap could be filled. And then using patient reported outcomes from the patient themselves yeah. on what yeah. the end result is and do they even understand what they're being told. Writing that down. <laughs> That's a <two>. Sorry. <laughs> Say the, the, the bill and ask for everybody's support to the governor's to office. To the governor's office. How do they get it to the governor's office? Nobody in this room other than you knows how to work legislation. Send them to me. I'll take them and get them to the, 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 the governor. It's just very oh, simple. Well, you can, but it's not, doesn't, okay, so this governor is not as friendly to health care as other governors have been. So Don Campbell is the person that. But she, there's a lot of dynamics that are going on there. So what we like to do is take a package of letters and deliver those package all together to Donna Campbell so she has them all. Mm -hmm. Rather than just letters coming in because she's got thousands of bills and they're in their last two weeks right now. So if there's a letter, like if, if anybody had a letter um, or they wanted to make a phone, they could make a phone call to Donna Campbell's office and we can get that information out. So but this bill in particular was championed by Cedar sinai uh, Dr. Rita Shane, uh, who uh, through family experience, she's the head of pharmacy for Cedar sinai She wrote the bill herself over, over uh, New Year's week and she cut it all the way to the governor's yeah, desk and it, governor. it has no funding associated with it. It mandates that uh, the patient has a comprehensive medication management review when they're hospitalized if, with certain severe conditions like right. heart failure. Right. So it's really a mom and apple pie good stuff. The opposition about it was for the small hospitals it would be a potential burden. Um, on the other hand, from a patient protection standpoint, it's pretty bread and butter important stuff. But there is good news in there, because Secretary Dooley is now Chief of Staff, so she moved over into a different department, so she's working right next to the governor. Mm -hmm. So that's, this is a big deal to her. So there's people in there that are whispering to say, sign this, sign this. So well, what we'll do you know pretty soon. The likelihood is, who knows? I mean, we have, our, we have a bunch of bills over there that, that have gone through that are really good bills that went through the legislature with zero opposition and we have no idea who's going to sign them. Does it speak so to how the pharmacist is paid? Not yet. Now we have, we, we did work, there was another bill that went through that was 1264 that was on hypertension CMM and that one got pretty far but it just, it didn't, it got withheld in the committee. All physicians in the room, if you would please do me a favor and fill out all the clinical people in the room, pharmacists, nurses, physicians, please fill out your continuing education forms so that LA Care will continue to uh, provide this to us free of charge. And sorry to cut you off. Uh, no, like, I'm keep talking legislation. No, I'm it's, it's been, when you say what's the likelihood, I would just say that even if it is not signed by Jerry Brown, it is very likely to be signed in a maybe a more comprehensive way by the next governor. Well, the good news is if he doesn't sign it and he doesn't veto it, it still becomes law. So, oh, that's great. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> and I know we're about out of time. I just wanted to make one more comment that heart.org, if you haven't gone there, is a great, great resource for professionals, for patients. We have provider tools, checklists, the patient interview form. We have sample order sets on there. So, you know, and here's some examples of some patient resources. So if you are ever in need of anything, feel free, go on the website, reach out to Bliss or myself, and we can point you in the right direction. So 
I, any last questions? I know we're about out of time, but thank you all so much for having us, and we are excited to be part of this group. Thank you. What a great day we've had together here, and uh, I just want to say thanks to Rand Corporation. We meet here every third Thursday of the month. We would love to have you all come back, be regulars, those of you who are new. And for those of you who were part of our initial pilot in San Diego, we would love to do a few more photos with Dr. Fremont uh, before you leave, if we can everybody gather up here. So thank you so much, and uh, we'll see you in October.